Have you ever wondered about the modern day sex trade? Well, stay tuned to meet two young people who've been called by God to minister to the victims of these heinous practices. My name is Yvonne Lewis. And I'm Jason Bradley, and you're watching Urban Report. Welcome to Urban Report. I've got my co-host, Jason. Hey. hey. Welcome. <laughs> and we have two special guests. Our guests today are Brian and Sophie Thomas. In the interest of full disclosure, I must tell you that this is my nephew and niece, and I'm so very proud of them for mm -hmm. following the Lord's leading. They have such an interesting story to tell that we just had to share it with you, our D2D viewers. So, Welcome to Urban Report. Thank you for having us out there. Appreciate you. that. Appreciate that. <laughs> yes, for sure, for yeah. sure. You guys have a very, both of you have great testimonies. And Brian, our viewers have not heard yours, and I really want them to hear both. So let's start with you. Tell us about where you were raised, how you were raised, okay. and what happened to you. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I mean, that's a, that's a lot for us to cover in a short amount of time. But uh, as you know, I was raised in Huntsville, Alabama um, with my parents and a younger sister. Uh, my father had a wonderful job as a rubber chemist for several prominent companies, which moved us around a lot and at the same time afforded us a, uh, a comfortable lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's almost like the American dream kind of thing. You know, you get your family and you had a good job and you're able to provide. You go to church and you live the, the life, you know, that you planned for when you were younger. We uh, moved to Detroit, Michigan after Buffalo, New York, and we uh, found ourselves moving back to Huntsville, Alabama when I was around 12, 13 years old, going into the ninth grade. And that year, my father decided that, you know, God had given him a revelation, and he was to write a book called The Submission Principle that would uh, give people principles on how to submit to God, therefore carrying out the purpose that he planned out for them. Hmm. But during the writing of his book, he felt as if he should quit his primary job. Hmm. And that, of course, had a domino effect because there was no other provision. Like, you know, he didn't plan, hmm. uh, I don't think, accordingly for what could happen. And he was just purely trusting on God. You know, but God gives us power over certain situations and circumstances, and we've got to be able to clearly hear what he wants us to do. Mm -hmm. And I, I think he just got confused in a few things mm -hmm. um, during his interpretations. So when he quit his job, everything was uh, taken from us in a sense. Uh, you know, you go from living a very comfortable lifestyle to, uh, to an impoverished lifestyle where, you know, I saw our cars get repossessed. I, we lived in a home that had no power, no lights, you know, no, wa no running water. You know, I used to have to walk to Nana and Pop Pop's house, I mean, my grandparents' house, in the mornings before school to take a shower, uh, and then walk to school. Mm. So, you know, my relationship with God uh, was strained during those times because if you're raised in a Christian household with, and instilled with certain values, this is completely contradictory of everything that, you know, you've been taught and that you were, you, you come to recognize and, um, and appreciate even. Mm. So it must have raised a lot of questions in your head. Millions. As to... Okay, so my dad is following what he thinks mm -hmm. is God's leading, mm -hmm. but yet it's making us dirt poor. Yeah, so and we're going through it. it go, and just like going through it. the domino effect. I think yes. that's really a, a great way to put it. So it had to create a certain confusion in your head and a certain anger. Well, I mean, you know, I think the initial response to emotion is um, confusion because you mm -hmm. don't know how to feel. And then mm -hmm. once you recognize it, the natural follow up is anger, like no matter what. So if you're hurt, the follow up is anger. If you're, you know what I mean? If you've uh, been offended, the follow up is anger. So whatever it is. So yeah, I was completely enraged by what happened, um, what my family had to endure, what we went through as a result of the choices that my parents made that I have absolutely no control over. So I'm just thrown in the situation, my younger sister and I. And um, during that time, of course, you, you rebel. 
You, mm. you don't want anything to do with, with, with a God who says, you know, I love you and I'll take care of you, and then I don't anymore. You know, it's like, why? And for, for me in, in, in this situation, all I wanted to do was get back to the place where we were. Mm. And it's not like, I'm like, God, if you're not going to do it, I'm going to do it. Um, mm. and, and guess what? I don't need you to do it because obviously, you know, you're, you're, you're missing from the picture here. Now, how did all that affect your relationship with your parents at the time? Because you would, you know, you're looking to them. They were providing a mm. lifestyle at first and that got snatched, mm -hmm. you know, as they were following what they felt was God's direction. How did that uh, affect your relationship with, with I your mean, parents? I let's, mean, let's be real. It didn't get snatched. Like they gave it up, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So it's, it'd be one thing if, and I'm old enough to understand these things. It'd be one thing if it was taken away, you know, mm -hmm. and the compounding events mm -hmm. were out of their control. However, this was something that they could control. Mm -hmm. And the results came from the choices they made. And we were affected by that. So, it's, so, so, so you're just angry, period. There is no, you know what I'm saying, in between. You love your parents still, you know, I don't ever think that that, that left at all. But the, the relationship is just strained to where I, I don't have to listen to you. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, why would I listen to you? Because yeah. you don't, you're not making solid choices to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I started working jobs. Um, I was always somebody that, you know, I'm not afraid to work. Uh, and I ended up uh, working at several jobs and I learned how to, you know, work systems, run scams mm -hmm. to make extra money because I'm the only one in the house that was working, you know. For, run scams? Like what? Yeah, like, okay, if I'm working at, I worked at a movie theater, and if you're going to get a, you know, they sell combos, popcorn and, and, and drinks and you right. know, candy. If you figure out how to run it and protect the inventory, I can sell you a popcorn and a, and a drink. And then you come up and you just get a drink. I'm keeping all those numbers in my head so that I can sell the 3 to $4 candy and make that 3 to $4 profit. If I do that 10 to 20 times a night, I just made off real good. Mm. So that's what I began to do. Uh, I worked at a grocery store because I got fired from that job because, you know. They, they caught they, you. They didn't catch me. I, you know, sin makes you dumb. Mm -hmm. So I got bold and just started taking money out of other people's registers if I wanted to. Mm. You know, so you got money, you're, you're going to come up short, you know. Mm. Um, Isn't it interesting, Brian, how the devil is like he, he plays on wherever you are at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you have anger, confusion, and yeah. all that, he'll play on that, mm -hmm. and then he'll he'll plant these little seeds of, mm -hmm. well, you can run this scam, or you can take this, or you can, and before you know it, mm -hmm. you are spiraling downward. Out of control. Mm -hmm. Out of control. Out of control. And he takes advantage of those opportunities. Mm -hmm. So I, I was working at a grocery store, and I can remember mom would come, and I, I was a cashier so I would swipe groceries through without ringing them up but it, mm -hmm. would, it would still be but she would pay ten dollars for you know mm -hmm. food for for a month you know mm -hmm. what I mean mm -hmm. uh, we were just trying to do I was trying to do whatever I could to help mm -hmm. and I met um, I ended up quitting that job because I was frustrated it was, you know it's not a lot of money you're not making no money I'm like I need to make some real money and I was approached by a, a friends a friend of mine older brother about money opportunity mm. and I'll never forget he's like you know your family is in a situation right now hmm. everybody knows your business you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying but it wasn't as if I was getting a lot of opportunities elsewhere nobody was you know they talk about it like you know it's a thing I think with us uh, in the church it's like we talk about people's problems and I'm gonna pray for you but nobody is active mm. in being a part of that person's situation or their restoration or, 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 or yeah. Physically oh. taking a part in it. Yeah. That's such a good point. That yeah. is. Because look at, you know, that ver verse in James where it says, you know, you, you pray for somebody mm -hmm. to get a coat. Mm -hmm. But you got a coat. But you, you got, got a coat. coat. <laughs> you know? Give them a coat. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that, and that's, there's a gap between Christianity, mm -hmm. the, the, the head knowledge, mm -hmm. and then living it. Oh, and absolutely. Practical Christianity. And that's what you're talking about is mm -hmm. what's missed a lot of times. Mm -hmm. I think, I, well, I like to think of it as, you know, um, organization versus organism, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning the church has gotten into a state of it's an organization mm -hmm. and organizations have meetings about problems, but an organism like your body, if you hurt your arm, you immediately go to protect that arm. Mm -hmm. You immediately comfort and console wherever that pain is, you mm -hmm. cover it. And that's where we have to make the shift to the, to an organism from organization from the body of Christ mm -hmm. is uh, perspective. But so, um, the friend gave me an offer. Mm -hmm. you know, to get involved with uh, 
the drug trade. Mm -hmm. And it seemed easy enough. It, it was opportunistic. I was like, man, you know, I know people who smoke weed, you know, at the time, mm -hmm. I smoke weed. Mm -hmm. So if I don't have to pay for it, and I know everybody else who does it, I could probably make some money from this. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, he, when, I, when, I, when I learned what I needed to learn, I went out and um, I did well, to, to put it simply. I did well and lived that lifestyle for uh, 17 years. Again, you know, it's that whole plan. Like, th there are two plans going on. Mm -hmm. We have the great controversy going on. Mm -hmm. So we have God's plan for your life, mm -hmm. which is to build you up mm -hmm. and to restore you and to conform you to his image, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's the enemy's plan, mm -hmm. who takes advantage of your situation mm -hmm. and just runs with it to destroy you. Yeah, so, yeah. And so where was your head at this point when you started you know, doing this, did you ever feel like, oh man, I shouldn't do this, or, or did you just give in to it and run with it? I, I'll be honest, I, uh, because of the culture, you know, and the people, the environment that I was around, mm -hmm. I just went full fledged for it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're not being, and I still had a, you know, loving parents, but. If you're not being celebrated, you know, you, you, you go to where you're celebrated, you know. Uh, you you want to go to not just where you're accepted and where people tolerate you, but where people are like, hey, you're doing a good job. Where you belong is something, and it's, and it's real for you. You know, sometimes I think that we put ourselves in positions to fall susceptible to things that aren't good for you just because it is real, mm -hmm. right? So as far as the church went, I didn't really want to be there because I didn't feel like it was real. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, people say they love you and they say these things, but... Nobody's really there. It, it didn't feel real for me, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know these guys up the street, and everything they say, they really, really do it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Whether it was good or it was bad. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to be a part of something that was real. So yeah, we were involved with that, and um, I didn't graduate high school as a result because I would rather be running the streets, claiming to take care of my family, but it's a selfish uh, point of view mm -hmm. and, 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 and disposition simply because I made it about me, you know. I, I didn't think rationally, like, you know, doing well for my family would be doing all the things that I'm supposed to do, you know. I, I didn't plan for future. I just want it right now, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, um, That's that another thing. Be crazy. That's such a good yeah. point, too, because there's, there's often such an inability to defer gratification. Mm -hmm. I want what I want, and I want it now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, that's, that's another thing that the devil plays on. Mm -hmm. You see, God thinks about the end game, mm -hmm. which is Long. having everybody saved. Mm -hmm. You know, he wants to save us so bad, but mm -hmm. the devil tries to distract us with all these temporary mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. to, to get us off course, to get us not focused on the end game, right. um, to, to get us to focus on the temporary mm -hmm. treasures, the money, and, mm -hmm. and all. Even, or even the temporary issues, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Because like all things pass, you know, everything's just for a season. I was focused on the issue, mm -hmm. and that took more precedence in my life than anything else. Mm. So, you know, we uh, we went through a lot. Um, homeless as a family, we, we, mm. we moved to California, and I lived out there, and we came back to Huntsville, and like I said, I didn't graduate high school. I ended up just living that type of lifestyle. I am uh, a three-time felon, you know, I'm still, even right now, currently fighting drug trafficking charges from 2013 for something I did four years ago. And uh, God had to do some things for me. I'm a person that requires harsh reality, just, just to be real. I need mm -hmm. harsh reality, you know, for it to really uh, make sense. I got to not just hit my head, it has to crack open. And I got to see what I'm thinking in order to make any type of, you know, change or even mm -hmm. to think about it. So in uh, 2014, after I caught a trafficking case, I caught a possession case. And I was like, I was sitting in jail, I was like, okay, God, I, you know, I've, I've lived this lifestyle for so long now that, and I know you're real, so if this is my time to get rid of everything and be done and follow you, because that's what it feels like. Like thing, There were things that were just happening that I can't control and that were so out of the norm, you know, it didn't make any sense. Mm. Like, I can't, you can't say, oh, it's the enemy attacking me. Look, God will chastise you too because he loves you. Mm -hmm. You know, just to put you in a position that's so dire, you got to come to him. That's right. And if you don't have the common sense to, you know, that's your fault. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he knows how to get your attention. Yeah, yeah he does. So he, he did what he needed to for me to get my attention. My father always said, I hate to see what you have to go through in order to get it, you know? Mm. And these were the things I had to go through. 
I kept getting pulled over by the police really for no reason. And they would say they were traffic infractions, but I never got a ticket, you know? DAWB? Just driving while black? No, I think just, uh, <laughs> yeah. driving while suspicious. I think the energy that you have, uh -huh. you know what I'm saying, is projected, and people can pick up on it, and uh -huh. they weren't wrong. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. It'd be a thing if they pulled me over and they was wrong. But they weren't wrong every time. <laughs> <laughs> you, you happen to be right. So mm -hmm. um, it was, I got pulled over in Birmingham, uh, and I was in jail all day, and I'm normally used to just you know bonding right out immediately, and I had the bond money on me. I have a lawyer, um, a bonding company that will come and get me with no issue, and people that are, you know, set up to come and get me when things happen. I'm a prepared individual. And they didn't let me use the phone all day, so by the time I got to use the phone and I called everyone, I said, God, let the sign be that the only person who answers the phone for me is my father, because I've got everything I need mm. to get out of here. Mm. So I literally called everyone. My lawyer, the bond company, and the bond company's 24 hours. It's their job <laughs> to stay by a phone right. to come and get you. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> they didn't pick up. So I'm like, I'm like, okay, guys, stop playing with me. And I call um, the list of friends that I have, and nobody's picking up the phone. I think that I'm like, I get an idea. And I, I, I'm, I'm sure it was the Holy Ghost, like, just, just really, like, he got a sense of humor, you know, playing <laughs> with me. And he was like, ask for your cell phone. So the idea hit me, like, ask for your cell phone, which is an evidence bag that they're not allowed to go into until after you're released, of course. Right. They can't go into it while you're there. Right. I asked for my cell phone. The guard went and got it, opened up my evidence bag that was stapled, and gave it to me. Wow. So I'm thinking, like, ha, ha, I did it. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. it worked, and nobody picked up the phone. I'm yeah. calling random people now. You know what I'm saying? I'm just trying to call, I'm trying to call any and everybody, you know what I'm saying, to not make this thing happen. Because I said, God, if you want me to quit, just give me a sign, and I'm going to pick the sign. So that's why I said, exactly what I said, you know, it has to be my father. And nobody picked up. And they said, you have one more time to use the telephone, and then we're going to send you upstairs. And I just couldn't go upstairs because you'll get lost, and it'll be a process trying to get out. Mm -hmm. I called my father. He picked up immediately. Mm. And so I went cold turkey with that, and that was the hardest thing I ever had to do. Uh, because essentially, you know, my life was on the line. I'm not, uh, it, I ha I'd gotten to a point where you're so immersed into it that you don't know how you're going to get out. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's gone past just being a recreational thing mm -hmm. to an organized thing. And you're responsible for this division of things, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And you're a primary guy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, not only do they want to know why you want to stop, because there'd been no issue. I could have just gone back and kept living the life. You know what I mean? That was available to me. Mm -hmm. You know, it was not as if I, I had to, I had to stop or or they were angry with me. No, I'm I'm a trusted guy. They they know that. Hey, look, whatever you need, we're gonna give it to you. But if you call and say, listen, I'm done, and not only am I done, but I don't I I don't you don't have to give me a second to get you what you need. You know, it's a, it's a, this is not the movies, mm -hmm. you know, and, and if it was the movies, you know how those situations end. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to eliminate any threat to the organization. Yep. So I had to immediately begin to trust God with harsh realities. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and uh, I know the, the grace of God covered me in all of that. Mm -hmm. Once I accepted, which was very difficult, so I want anybody to take it lightly. Like, it's not a light thing to put your life on the line, but that is what we're called to do as Christians, mm -hmm. to say, God, I will trust you despite... Mm -hmm. what it might cost me. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and, and, I, and I accepted the fact that if you decide that it'd be my fate that I die behind this, then at least I die for something right. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? I'm going to do this one thing right because I've done so much wrong in my life. Mm -hmm. And he covered the situation and uh, blessed me. And not only did I take care of, of the individual that needed to be taken care of, but they did what they needed to do to find out that, okay, you, you didn't tell on us because mm -hmm. I think it's a sin to snitch. Mm -hmm, you know what I mean? mm -hmm. uh, and they like, you know, you got our blessing to go. So as soon as that happened, um, I... Which also is a miracle. Yeah. Oh, no. I mean, yeah. just, just that is like, a miracle. These people know where your family lives. Exactly. Exactly. So, so, so yeah. But, and, and we want you to know that if you're caught up, Mm -hmm. In something that seems deadly, mm -hmm. God can deliver you. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Just trust him. You, you, might get, you might be caught up in the same thing. The Lord might have had you tune in to watch this program today to hear Brian's story, mm -hmm. to know that God can deliver you too. From anything. Mm -hmm. Just know that he's there for you. Mm -hmm. Just like he delivered Brian, he can deliver you. I mean, the thing is, if he never put you in situations that you couldn't control, you would think that you could do it without him.
Exactly. So he puts us in these situations to be able oh, to develop point. the trust yes. that is required to, to, to live and pursue the purpose that he has for us. Because oh, if you don't good. trust him, you, don't, you have no faith, then everything is dead. That's Take right. it back to the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that all this you can you can touch, mm -hmm. but this one tree, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this one tree, mm -hmm. you got it. He gives us a choice. Yeah. Absolutely. So what ended up happening was I was baptized today, three years ago. Oh, immediately oh, after that, that happened. In, that happened on January seventeenth, where I made the decision, and in February eighth, two thousand fourteen, I uh, I submitted and was baptized. So this is a commemorative day for me. And, and, and we're here, so that's, you know, the Lord. that's, that's <laughs> awesome. Because I never thought that I would be, you know, right here, right now, mm -hmm. or I've done the things that God has afforded me to be able to do uh, within the time limit he's been able to do. It's been three years for me, and we've done some amazing things. Mm -hmm. So I was baptized, and then out of the blue, um, Oakwood University Church called me <laughs> and said they wanted me to be a part of a revival with them. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm fresh out, you know, the street, and I'm like, look, I'm not doing no revival. <laughs> right? that's what I'm I didn't say that to them, but that's right. what I'm thinking. Right, right. I'm like, but I told God that I would do whatever he asked me to do, yeah. and, I, and I would know it was from him based on who he sent, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't call Oakwood and say, let me do this, mm -hmm. you know? They reached out to me. So I'm like, okay, God, you've got a plan for this. I'll do it. Next thing you know, I find myself in neighborhoods that are familiar with me, knocking on doors of people who are familiar with me, mm -hmm. uh, saying, you want to have a Bible study and pray? Oh, wow. And it was an amazing thing because as uncomfortable as I was with that because you're fearful of what people might think. And right. you, know, you go through all of that in your right. mind because you're somebody, you're this. Mm -hmm. And if you're not this, then what are you? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? God mm -hmm. is doing a new thing and he's, he's rewiring you. Mm -hmm. That's what has to take place. Mm -hmm. The amazing thing was that I was able to get in every home that not the average, you know, evangelist might be able to get into because I look just like you, you know, and I'm somebody that you were looking to out here before. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, hold on. You want to come in here and pray with and have Bible study with me? <laughs> <laughs> what happened to you? Right. You know, I got to hear this, happens. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is yeah. A, yeah. Um, it is a, uh, a story piece, you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? It is something that will break any ice, mm -hmm. I think, as long as you're transparent with people. And it's mm -hmm. not about, I've been perfect my whole life, and you just need Jesus, and you can be perfect too, because that's not how it goes. Right. Yeah. You know? So we did that, and in that effort, um, during that revival time, there were 60-some-odd people baptized, and that was a blessing. But the, the extra was, like, the partner that I was partnered with and I were responsible for over 40 of them. Mm -hmm. So I saw, I said, okay, God, Praise you know, Lord. you, right. this, is, this, is, this is different. You know, you know, I, we're not trained in evangelism. I'm not a Bible scholar, you know, uh, but you can use me. And that, that's exactly the point. Mm -hmm. You made yourself available that's and that's right. all you to God. To and that's all. God's not looking for theologians mm -hmm. and Bible scholars, although I believe that by now you are becoming that. Mm -hmm. but, but you got to prepare. You got to prepare. You got to know. But. He just wants you to be available. Yeah. Period. Right? Just yeah. say, Lord, I'm available to yeah. you. He can do much more with somebody that's willing than somebody who's able and stubborn. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I know it all. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so, so we, uh, we did that. And shortly after, my brother, Jeremy Anderson, who uh, was converted in 2009 and had been on his faith walk. And you know how when somebody changes, you, you know, and it happened to me, too. People did it to me, too. They're like, oh, you're going to follow God now? <laughs> yeah, like, right. Uh -huh. like, I'll see hold you later you. on. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah hold yeah. you in your past. Yeah. yeah. Well, not just hold you in your past. They're used to people not being consistent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not even their fault. It's a programming, mm -hmm. you know, of people that are inconsistent. And it's still an issue today because you have people in the church, but they're not consistent. You know, I suffered from that reality, and that's also why I didn't go there, mm -hmm. you know? So we've got to be the change that we want to see. Um, so it's, a, it's a theory of if you can't find any good people, be one. So if you can't find any real Christians, be one. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so my brother Jeremy Anderson was that for me. Mm. And he, uh, he was a part of the decision that I made because he sat down and talked to me and was like, look, bro, you can't touch nothing else or do nothing else. And so I made the decision that if I died, th that I spoke on earlier, at his house, you know, during mm. a 45-minute conversation that we had. So he called me one day uh, and said that he came from Bermuda. And he came from Bermuda and he had just shared my testimony with people because he calls himself a testimony stealer. Like, he was like, I'm gonna share your testimony if you won't. Uh -huh. So 
he was out there and he shared it. And he said, bro, you've got to do something with that. And God told me that we're supposed to do something and we're going to start it. I'm going to call this thing the Grace Tour. And I want you to come and speak and share your testimony at a church uh, in uh, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And it was in April 2014. I said, you know, in my mind, I won't do that. Because mm -hmm. I don't want to tell people my business, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to, because I know yeah. how judgy people in the church can be, mm -hmm. even though it's not our assignment to tell people how we feel, only how God feels about them. That's our reality. Mm -hmm. People will do more talking about you than talking with and for you to God. So I was like, you know, I don't know if I want to put all this out here. It, it was an uncomfortable thing, but nothing grows in comfort. So, like I said, mm -hmm. I would do it. Anything you ask me to do, God, I'll do it. I know by who you send. And my brother asked me. I just told him I would. And we went. And it was a blessed event. We did like four events that year. Well, no, we did like six events that year. And we were traveling place to place. Uh, we hit Texas, like Dallas, Houston, um, New York, uh, Missouri. And I just saw the effect that it was having. And I was like, man, God, like, I'm not a trained speaker. You know, I'm not somebody that has the experience or the qualifications, but God doesn't, you know, call the qualified. He qualifies mm -hmm. the call. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, wow, you know, if I can be used for this, this is what I want to do. And we went full time ministry in 2015 um, with something that was developed through my brother, Jeremy Anderson and his wife, Tracy Anderson, their nonprofit called Next Level Living. Mm -hmm. And we developed what's called the Grace Tour. We traveled on the road in 2015 for three weeks out of the month. We were mm -hmm. on the road witnessing, ministering, speaking to any and everyone that we could. Mm. Uh, churches, Evangelism 101, teaching them how to get outside of the church and into the community so that mm -hmm. they can become more relevant, therefore making Jesus more relevant. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like the days of going with tracks is not where you live right now. That's not the time that we're in right now because people are hungry. So if I don't first provide your need, you're not going to want to listen to me. Mm -hmm. Like don't knock on my door with a track and you don't got a burger or, you know, or a sandwich or something. Like, I'm hungry. Can I get that? And then uh -huh. we can talk about this. Uh -huh. you know what I mean? Can uh -huh. you show or so, express a genuine care for what I'm So you're I not eat? saying don't give out a track, but what no. you're saying is not saying that, that, that you have to meet people where, where they, they are. are. That's what Jesus did. Yeah. That's met what he met people did. where they were. He fed the hungry. He healed That's the sick. He and then he preached. See, Jesus them. never right. preached Jesus. He didn't walk up and say, I am Jesus, follow. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? He said, what is it you need? Oh, you're, you're lame? Get up and walk. Oh, you're blind? Here, see, mm -hmm. now follow me. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. He gave people an incentive and a reason. He showed them that he cared. Mm -hmm. And when people saw that, they were like, oh, man, I ain't never experienced no love, love yeah. like this before. Yes. And that is what was attractive. So that's what we are, um, and that's what we do. So when, speaking of love, mm -hmm. when did Sophie come into the picture? This is a good place yeah, to bring yeah. a little Sophie perfect, in now. Perfect segue. Yeah. <laughs> did well with that. <laughs> <laughs> Sophie actually came into the picture um, three months into the Grace Tour in 2015. Okay. It was March, and we were in Las Vegas, and um, our sister Tracy Anderson, Jeremy's wife, uh, lost her mother, mm -hmm. and they had to go and see about the family, and they left us in Las Vegas, and we had, you know, assignments to speak at schools and group homes and detention centers and churches and so forth. And I was assigned uh, to, to preach for the main service at Abundant Life Church in Las Vegas, Nevada. And I was like, you know, wow, this is going to be interesting because I've never <laughs> gotten into a pulpit yeah. and preached before. Yeah. But let's just say God blessed. An amazing experience. And I mm -hmm. said, okay, God, you know, you know, new heights, new levels. Everything mm -hmm. is about going to the next level, which mm -hmm. is why our nonprofit is called Next Level Living. So I was still in Las Vegas and somebody suggested to me on Facebook a page to go on like, and it was a Jesus is King page. And I'm like, I like Jesus. Jesus is my man. So I go to the page, and I like the page. When I like the page, you know, it'll show you who else likes the page, right? And I saw this wonderful-looking woman. <laughs> I saw this divine creature. <laughs> you hear me? I got to get my Barry White voice. This gorgeous <laughs> creation. And I said, wow, I think, I, think, uh, I, think, I, think, I think I should talk to her, you know? Because at this point, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a helpmate. I'm right. just be real. Mm -hmm. I can and someone who loves Jesus, God. yes, Period. yes. And my sister mm -hmm. Sula Skiles, um, who's a pastor uh, and a church planter down in Destin, Florida, with her husband John Skiles, we've been growing close and praying. She literally prayed for a specific type of woman with certain characteristics. Mm -hmm. I began to look for those things. I go to her page, mm -hmm. and I literally went from, uh, it was 2015, and all the way back to 2000, whenever she started her page. And <laughs> the entire thread was consistent. 
the whole thing. It was just the light, you know. It was beautiful. It was joyous. It was encouraging. Mm -hmm. You know, it was inspiring. There were biblical references. It was just, it was just like joyful, you know. And I saw that and I said, I like that. (laughs) 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 So of course, I jumped in her DM. I hit her inbox like, How are you? You know. You're so blessed. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> with that talk. And she didn't say nothing to me. She didn't respond for a while. And finally, as, like, as I said, I study things, and I like, you know, a challenge. Like, as men, we love to be able to pursue something. Mm. You know what I mean? Don't make yourself so readily available that it looks like this is what you do. Mm. You bounce and bounce and bounce. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Be unavailable to a degree. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, the, she was the hunters. Yeah, man. She men was that. The so uh, one day, you know, I discovered that she likes, you know, she's a fan of food, like most women are, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, they say food's the way to a man's heart. No, it, it's not. It's to a woman. You know what I mean? So, so I said, um, hey, sis. I hit her with the sis. I think that's that, that word, you know uh-huh, what I mean? Uh-huh. Holy Ghost said, say sis. I said, hey, sis. Non threatening, you know. Right, <laughs> not hey baby. Yeah, hey, yeah, hey, yeah, sis. yeah, we yeah. wouldn't do that. Yeah. But she was like, hey sis, and I said something, she responded, and we just kind of spoke, and she said, listen, I said, can I have your number so we could talk further? Like, I'd love to just grow in Christ with you. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she said, she said um, well, listen, thank you, I'm flattered, but I'm really focused on purpose right now. And I said, ooh, <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I, I like that. <laughs> So when she said that, I said, okay, that's somebody that, you know, I can see myself being with. So, you know, if it ain't her, whatever, I know what to look for. But you're talking quality. Mm. Quality. Mm. Inside and outside. Period. Mm -hmm. Period. And um, so I left her alone for a second. But it was all while I was still in Vegas. And what she did was the the, the sermon that I preached in Vegas was recorded at the church. And Mm -hmm. I had posted the link on my page. So she went to my page and she clicked the link and she watched it. Mm. And I, so I'm like, God knew what he was doing. Right? <laughs> like, God, you know what you're doing, setting all this up, right? <laughs> so so she, she, she watched it. And then the Grace Tour, we have videos on YouTube that mm-hmm. you can go and watch. And um, she started to look up the Grace Tour. So she watched all the videos, you know. And next thing you know, I, I get a, uh, a message on, on Instagram, you know, from Facebook to Instagram. And she followed me on Instagram, I followed her back. And I was like, oh, you like the videos, huh? (laughs) (laughs) Now, what were you thinking, Sophie, when you saw (laughs) What were you thinking? Um, I never seen a group of um, young people on fire for the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't around that. And um, I was in a place of my own, you know, pursuing um, God with all my heart. And um, I just didn't have that around. So I was just very, very encouraged and inspired. And I had my son. I said, Andrew, you have to look at these wonderful young people that are going around the country. You know, the ye there or go ye there for ministry, really. You know, and um, it just was so encouraging to me. So I decided after his few attempts to just send him an encouraging message and say, hey, brother, um, <laughs> you know, I just like for you guys to know that I'm praying for you guys. What you guys are doing is a phenomenon and I'll keep you guys lifted up in prayer. Keep doing what you're doing. God mm-hmm. bless pretty much. Mm-hmm. That was the message. And mm-hmm. what happened next? And he was just I'm like, <laughs> yeah, 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 number. Yeah. She wouldn't give me a telephone number. Uh-huh. So what she gave me was her Skype. So we began to Skype, uh-huh. um, yeah. like messaging. And then I actually got a Skype video I, t- I called it a Skype date, and um, we spoke, you know, and, 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 and really developed a, uh, a bond through that, you know. And where were you living? Connecticut. Oh, okay, mm-hmm. so yeah. you were living in Connecticut. I was living and you Connecticut. were still in Huntsville. Well, I was on the road at that time, but yeah, okay. still, you know, Huntsville was yeah, home. That was your but, base. Mm-hmm. But we were still, you know, just really getting into the, the, the tour. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we talked for a while. Um, and, and kept speaking, and finally I got her number. She mm-hmm. let me call her, and we, you know, we, would, we talked every day. Uh, and then it was like two months later, it was May, Memorial Day weekend, mm-hmm. and I was like, you know, we should meet. We should meet up. So I flew to New York, and she came and picked me up. I went back to Danbury, Connecticut, where her family is, and spent uh, Memorial Day weekend with them, mm-hmm. you know, and got in with the family. Uh-huh. And, you know, they they, you they know, love his Thai, cooking. Thai people oh. love, they <laughs> barbecue. Ah, okay. They barbecue and all they want all they want to do is barbecue. So, <laughs> <laughs> just, I, I'm like, just like us, you know, just like me. So, 
So, so, so I, I, I cook for them, you know what I mean? I, I, I barbecued and I made, you know, I make some baked beans that I, you know, uh, that they love and, and made all this stuff. So they were like, hey, you're, you're cool with us. You know what I'm saying? So we got in there. And um, every month I flew her out to wherever I would be on the road. Yeah, we made a commitment that we would see each other. And then we were married uh, four months later. Wow. wow so how months. long was the courtship all together? Four months. Four months. <laughs> four months. <laughs> March wow. to July. Wow, that's incredible. Right. And you got married how long ago? When was uh, it? Well, we had our wedding um, ceremony. ceremony, Memorial Day weekend. Last of year. 2016, but we were married in uh, 2015. In that was a beautiful wedding. Oh, yeah, right? it was, that was coming too. <laughs> fabulous. Thank really you. beautiful, yeah. really Thank beautiful. You. So God has now called the two of you yes, into a ministry with the sex trade. How mm -hmm. did that happen and what's that all about? Well, well, well even, okay, let me give context because prior to Good. that, this came because uh, God asked me to do something and I wrote a book. And, you know, we developed the book and we put it out in 2016, you know, as you know, called The Plug. And with that, he also asked us to start our own ministry and our own programs for schools. What I was doing with the Greeks too already, just an extension, you know, and something that we would reside over. Um, so that we could grow, you know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we and we were in schools with mentorship programs, uh, teacher um, empowerment sessions, you know, mm -hmm. realigning them with their purpose. It's called the Teachers Covenant, and just really uh, encouraging and inspiring people to pursue their purpose and their passions mm -hmm. every single day. Mm -hmm. it's, and it's called the Activate Series. So we developed a company, and it's called Activated Ministries. Well, a ministry called Activated Ministries, rather, and we. Um, my wife's, our intentions were for her to quit her corporate job that she made great money at and go full-time ministry because that's what, that's where her heart was. So in March 2016, mm -hmm. she did, she quit her job mm -hmm. uh, through a series of events that God showed us, like, this is what he wanted us to do. And we, we walked that walk mm -hmm. and are still there, you know, now. Um, 2016, uh, what month was it, honey, where Jeremy Krause contacted you? Um towards probably September. Like mid-August, right? Mid-August, September, yeah. Yeah, so my sister Sula Skaza, we spoke of, mm -hmm. has become Sophie's mentor. Mm, yeah. And Sula is a survivor of sex trafficking. and She's now a mm -hmm. phenomenal speaker for it, mm -hmm. a part of um, many organizations that fight this uh, horrendous injustice. Mm -hmm. So we always knew that we would always do something together, mm -hmm. and we just didn't know what it would be. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sophie was on Instagram one day and, well, she tells it better than I do, so. Well, I was on Instagram one day and I, you know, this man was just liking all the pictures and the ministry pictures and stuff like that. And I went on his page and I saw that him and his wife are in Thailand and they're doing ministry in Thailand. And, and obviously Thailand is my home. Mm -hmm. So, um, and uh, saw that they're, you know, in the human trafficking um, arena. So I just sent them a message and say, hey, you know, brother, you know, you guys are doing an awesome job in Thailand. And, you know, I'm going to continue to pray for you and your wife and your ministry. And he hit us up right away and say, hey, I see that you're a Christian and you're Thai because there's 1% in Christianity in Thailand. 1%? Wow, 1%. Lower than 1%. A lot of work to do. Wow. Five, yeah. So when I accepted Christ, I'm, I've come from a home of, of Buddhism, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm the only Christian in my home. Wow. So um, when I accepted Christ, I've always asked God, like, God, use me as your hands and feet to go back home to increase that number. I want to go spread, you know, the love of Christ there. And, but I didn't know in what avenue. So when Jeremy and I spoke, it, it just, you know, the Holy Spirit just spoke to us. And then being around my mentor, Sula, um, and hearing her story and part with, you know, the traumatic um, background that I came from, dealing with trauma and sexual abuse and all that stuff, it just, it just really heightened my passion for, for human and sex trafficking. We need to hear your testimony. I was just getting ready to say, Man, give us a, need, give us yeah. a, a snippet. A little, yeah. Yeah, well, I, what happened? I was born um, in, in Thailand in a small village, you know, to a family of farmers, very poor. Came in was to actually sponsored by a Christian lady mm. uh, to the United States and stayed in Connecticut in all my life. But in my culture, um, women are very marginalized, right? and uh, we are to be submissive at any cost. So the blueprint I have was, you know, I, I was domestic violence and alcohol abuse and 
I was sexually molested by family members by the age of 12 and mm -hmm. you know and and I think at that very moment is when I uh, questioned my value and my worth because my father didn't protect me when these things were mm -hmm. presented so your father knew about the abuse well yeah mm -hmm. um, but in my culture you don't talk about things mm -hmm. you just keep it moving mm -hmm. you know and uh, so I think that was the point of me determining how I was going to look at myself and my life. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have an identity. Mm -hmm. you know, I was always the lesser person, you know. So uh, after that, just a series of uh, attempted suicides and cutting myself was just a way of mm -hmm. dealing with dysfunction mm -hmm. and, and trauma. And then, you know, I had my son at 17, uh, and that was a domestic violence relationship as well. Um, this was my blueprint, you know, if I've given myself to, to a man, this was going to be my husband for the rest of my life, regardless of what's going to go on, you know, and that's, that was my mindset. Devil of the lie. So that, that was my mindset, mm -hmm. just going through life now, not fully knowing who I am and, and understanding my value and my worth. Even at the age of my early 20s, accepting Christ um, through a relationship, I was, I was dating a pastor's son at the time, and that's how, you know, I encounter Christ. Christianity, but just on, you know, the surface. I've never heard the gospel before. Never mm -hmm. heard the gospel before. And one evening I was um, invited by his, his mother uh, to come and hear um, a, a man speak from South Africa. You gotta come, Sophie, you gotta come. This man is awesome. I went out of respect. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I went to church, but I was, I'm a Buddhist. Mm -hmm. I haven't converted, but I'm going out of respect for the elders and stuff, so I went to hear the, the speaker, I was sitting in the way, way back, and um, at the, I, don't even ask me what the sermon was about, because I don't know, my mind was totally on something else. Mm -hmm. At the end of the, 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 the service, he said, you know, young lady with the floor dress sitting in the back, you know, come, come over, come up to the altar. And I'm looking around like, who is he talking about? Not me, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, what, what, what is this about, yeah. you know? And he said, you know, young lady, you know, please come up, I, you know, I would like to pray for you. And I was like, okay, I got up and not even all the way up, probably to the center of the uh, altar, I, I felt just an overwhelming presence. Wow. Mm. And I started to shake and cry really, really badly. And as I got up here, he just looked in my eyes and he said, you know, you're, you're just so precious. And um, you're going to evangelize around the world one day. And that was the message to me. I didn't know what evangelism is. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what evangelizing. I've never heard the gospel. So mm -hmm. I'm just mm -hmm. like crying because I'm emotional. I'm feeling this present that was warm and it was electricity. And I, it, was just, it was just overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And he's speaking these things. And then the elders of the church just got around and prayed for me. Mm -hmm. I didn't know still what was going on. But that night, though, that night I knew it was Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I felt the Holy Spirit because he visited me in my dream. Mm. And it was just a beautiful dream where I remember to this day, and I'll tell everybody and anyone if they ask about Christ, is that, you know, I was walking on the road just like Paul in Damascus. I was walking on this road, just walking, walking, and just very down in the dream. And then soon there was just a light, like a glory, and it was just so heavy that I couldn't even look right into it because it would, you know, blind me. That was the light. So I turned away a little bit, and then I felt this light coming by me. And as it past me, I was able to turn around a little bit. And then this man's face, who I know was God, was Jesus, looked and smiled. And it was so bright. And he said to me, you shall not die. Mm. And that was my dream. I woke up the next day. I was just cr crying and call, calling my pastor. And I, I went to church the following weekend and, and accepted Christ mm. as my Lord and Savior. I didn't know still what the gospel, but I know I never felt something so real. Yeah. And so 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 tangible it was a tangible encounter you know it was just not just reading scriptures and just you know surface mm -hmm. um, right. Um, right. Um, knowledge but it actually had an encounter now, and he's so real like that how did mm -hmm. your family react to that since right I know. none of them were christian so like how did they respond to that well they mocked me a lot at first mm -hmm. so my grandmother who is a, a religious Buddhist, um, she was very um, actually supportive to it. Mm. Um, she would say, hey, you know, I heard about Jesus Christ. He's a good man. You know, mm. you do whatever you want to do. And that was her stance on it. But other family members mocked me. Like they, wouldn't, they would say, you know, don't talk about Jesus Christ around here. 
you know, when people would ask me, okay, what happened? And they was they started to get curious because of the change mm -hmm. in the lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So they would get curious about it and they would ask and it would be my opportunity to share a little bit of, of my story. Mm -hmm. But it, it got so bad where I got so offensive sometimes because they would be like, you Jesus freak or, mm -hmm. you know, or, you know, don't come around here talking about Jesus. You know, we're Buddhists and this is our culture and this is our religion. And, you know, you do what you want, but you don't come around here and, and speak those things. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was dealing with, with a, a, a lot. But even at that time, I didn't have a faith-based home, so I, it, it wasn't strong, you mm -hmm. know? The connection that I had was through my ex-boyfriend, his parents, and his side of the family. So when that relationship ended, I didn't have anybody, mm. kind of, to really be mentored by and to really just help me through this this, walk, this faith walk. So I, I kind of was lost mm -hmm. through, through my ways and, and um, didn't really fully submit was believer, but not a true follower. Right. You know? So what was the what marked the turning point? The turning point was going through so many different relationships with different men, mm -hmm. trying to find love. Mm -hmm. You know, only to be abused. You know, uh, same 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 spirit, different faces. Right. Never really dealing with who I am and identifying myself with Christ. So I continued to go through this life of just different relationships through different relationships. And it wasn't until the, the last relationship before Brian, I've never really been single because I was scared to be alone, mm -hmm. okay? So the last relationship before um, Brian, I said, I'm done, you know, I'm done with, with this. And um, got on my knees one day and it wasn't until, I'm, I'm, it was like two and a half years ago, I said, I'm done God, I want your way and your will only, um, I fully submit. I, mean, I don't think that people fully submit because of the pain and the cost that is associated with full submission. Mm -hmm. You're gonna lose a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. People are scared of change and they don't wanna let go of certain things, even things that they say they love that are not good for them, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I said, that's it. That's it, I'm, I'm done, all you. And I'll tell you that room, when I, when I say encounters, He's so good and real like that. I felt such a warmth that evening in my bedroom, and I knew that there, there was a whole transformation that had taken place. Yes, I, I've accepted Christ. Um, I had this revelation of his love for me, but transformation doesn't take place until you get that full revelation of his love mm. and who you are. And, what you're made to do. Mm. So that changed me totally. And that morning, I tell you, I, it was just a whole weight lifted off. I started to really, really pursue um, the things that God has placed in my life. And I fell in love with Christ. Yeah. I fell in love to the point where I said, God, if I wasn't going to get married, marry or have a husband, I'm good because this is so fulfilling. I've never felt mm. so good and so fulfilled in my life. Mm -hmm. you're, so you're glad that didn't that didn't happen, right? Seven months later, I showed up. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, to any single ladies out there, you know, you, you, if you chase him, that is the key. Yeah, is that just not the key? Because chase the Lord him. wants your heart first. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Then, then someone else yes. can can be a part of that. But you and him first. Yes. I, yes. I really I believe that too with all yeah. my heart. Yeah. And and it was so crazy because it just like even though I didn't want a husband, he had the Holy Spirit had really really placed in my heart to really understand and read about healthy relationship because I didn't have healthy relationships. Mm -hmm. I had broken relationships, mm -hmm. um, full of abuse and lies and you know things and. I started to read about healthy relationships, so how, just simple healthy relationships with family and friends and coworkers. Mm -hmm. It was simple. Um, and he got me onto, I watched one video of Dr. Miles Monroe and he talked about relationship and, and, and how, you know, we women meet men in heat and in passion, not in purpose mm -hmm. and in vision. So, um, and that really was profound to me mm -hmm. because it just really explained, you know, the, the, the cycle that I went through, you know, and I'm like, that's it. If he's not in passion, I mean, if he's not in purpose and in vision, I can't even talk to, to the dude, yeah. <laughs> basically. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Like, our conversation is like, what kind of vision do you have mm -hmm. for but our life, you know? Look at what God did. Yeah. He set you guys up in purpose. Mm -hmm. In purpose. And and I, I really want that you're, 
your testimony is amazing too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, Very look at so. look at what God has done. He He worked on both of you mm -hmm. apart, mm -hmm. healed you mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you were broken. Mm -hmm. And it's then, still broken. And then still brought broken. you yeah. together. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're all, you know, we're, we're all still walking. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But but he healed you mm -hmm. by attaching you to him. Mm -hmm. And then you guys could attach to each other mm -hmm. in purpose. He, he has to be the So foundation. let's talk about the sex trade because yeah, yeah. I can't believe how our time is going away. <laughs> no. and, yeah. and your testimonies are just so profound. And our viewers need to know who you are yeah. because you're getting ready to take all that God has given you mm -hmm. into the mission field. Right. Mm -hmm. Tell us about it. Well, there's just another level of ministry that he's called us to. You know, it's all, God is always about increase and expansion. Mm -hmm. So uh, he's called us to the anti-humanist sex trafficking field. We uh, founded a nonprofit organization that is called the G51 Project, which is founded on the principles found in uh, Galatians 5.1, mm -hmm. which says, my wife quotes it better than I do. Okay. <laughs> But it's, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Mm -hmm. So stand firm and do not let yourselves be yoked by, an, by, by slavery ever again. Mm -hmm. right. So that's what G51 is founded on, yeah. The and we have a website we're going to put up too. Yeah, thank you. Um, the entire verse is just in the chapter is about freedom in Christ, period. So, um, so as she said, we, we, we talked to Jeremy Krause, the founder of the uh, Thrive Rescue mm -hmm. International Organization in Thailand. Mm -hmm. We spoke with him, and, in, and immediately, you know how sometimes you just have a connection with people yes. like, like it's a divine connection period like I just feel connected to you you feel connected to me mm -hmm. and there's something for us to do right let's figure it out right we had that conversation and shortly after he posted that Thrive Rescue was hosting a schooling called Thrive Justice School mm -hmm. which has Thrive a, what school Thrive Justice school. Justice school. Mm -hmm. yes ma'am which is an extensive and intensive training mm -hmm. uh, for six weeks and upon completion you will be certified in global injustice response qualifying you to speak globally on this particular injustice mm. so that's what we will be obtaining and we're headed to Thailand uh, in June and we're currently fundraising for that as well as other things that God has just given us to develop like a safe haven home mm -hmm. for victims that have been rescued mm -hmm. for their restoration and their rehabilitation mm -hmm. and we will be formulating that and um, building it wherever he tells us to but uh, most likely within Huntsville, so Alabama. What are your current needs? What do you need? Uh, we need partners man. We need partners and fundraising you need funds, you know, because mm -hmm. this thing costs. Yeah. So what we did was we took 3000 out of our, you know, savings account. You know, we're not, you know, financially, you know, rich people. You really know the I mean? last bit that we have. Right. Mm -hmm. um, just because God, that's what he said to do. So, you know, it's not a thing. Like, he gave it to us, you'll take care of us. We're not worried about that. We'll give it to you. We've seen way too many miracles mm -hmm. and know that you can do all things to ever begin to doubt you now. And he sustained us, right? Wow. So it's really just about him being able to trust you with what he's preparing you to receive. Mm -hmm. So we gave that, and we've been raising the money. We're 51% um, we're, we're of the way there now. So that's just a, a blessing and a testimony in mm -hmm. itself because every month we make it. You know yeah. what I mean? So we're currently fundraising for that venture. As I said, we'll be there for six weeks. And when we come back, we will be developing the safe house for victims that have been rescued and we'll be partnering with local law enforcement, U.S. Marshals, FBI, and other organizations that are uh, fighting to eradicate this injustice. Well, how prevalent is it in, uh, the U in the United States? Because, you know, you don't hear that much about it. $13 billion a year. In the U.S. alone, well, 13 billion. billion, 150 billion worldwide. 150 billion worldwide. So, so how does it work? Million. How does it work? How does a, a girl become enslaved? Well, there's several ways. You know, um, like for instance, with our sister Sula, they met her at a party out in Hollywood, promised her a modeling contract because she did model, and got her a ticket. But it was a one-way ticket. And she was so excited about the opportunity and the people and where she was, it looked so great, that she didn't really suspect anything. Right. She gets on the plane, she goes, and she was the gift for a billionaire's wife. Oh. Yes, yes. My. She was a gift for a billionaire's wife, and she, she was there for many months. And uh, How is it that they can't get Well, when you get there, they take all your documentation. They take your passport. Mm. Take oh, your, she uh, was. She came from another land. She no, came, she came from here, here to from here. California, and went somewhere toward the Middle East. Oh, right? I got you. Okay. So they take all of your information. Okay. So you're at their mercy period. Got you. Um, and they and, and and it is a, a life threatening situation. Mm -hmm. And she saw people not come back. You know, if if they were uh, rebellious and so forth. So they she submitted. They you up. That she submitted. Um, she was. Mm -hmm. They drug you. They, they, it's, it's a breakdown process where you uh, don't trust people. 
you can't talk to people, you have no resources, you have no network, and you're pretty much just a slave. It's, it is the exact same thing that was happening with slavery from Africa to Americas and so forth, where people are just sold. Um, there are, like I said, 27 million people in sex trafficking, and it happens in various ways. You have the modeling situations with promises of better jobs, where mothers and their daughters have been duped into it like there's stories of that happening then there's also social media which is super super dangerous super. right now because if you had you meet a young man he promises you these things he'll be your boyfriend for a while even and then they will literally set them up to be raped you know they'll drug them they'll rape them you wake up and you're in this situation now uh, mm -hmm. you have no freedoms you have no rights and you are no longer a person you are a commodity and the reason why it's so uh it's fair financially true. prosperous is because I can sell a person over and over again. Wow. I can continue to sell you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what you in each you situation. Want to. Uh, yeah. Period. So wow. So they do it. Um, there's also recruiting from what they call bottom girls. You know, we won't call it what, it, what, the, what they call it, but it, but basically a recruiter um, that's been broken in and they will go out. They will befriend you. Mm -hmm. you and, and you're a young person. This isn't about a poverty issue, a good neighborhood, bad neighborhood thing, good family, bad neighborhood. No, they're coming for your daughters. You understand? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter. If you are a human being with vulnerabilities, mm -hmm. you are suspect for, for it's happened to you. Mm -hmm. And that's any and everybody mm -hmm. to whatever age. So in America, the average age is from 12 to 16 years old. Um, and 76% of those victims are young Caucasian females. Uh, worldwide, out of the 27 million, 14% are, uh, are children ages 12 to 16. Mm. It's so horrendous. Like we believe that this is evil in its purest form. Like this is the most demonic presence on earth because you have to be fully engulfed in demon possession mm -hmm. to sell a child. You're raping kids. You know I mean? You're yeah. setting kids, kids up to be raped. Yeah. Oh, and it, it's and it's you, so evil. And like you, and in the it's south, it's hard to talk about. Yeah, mm -hmm. and in the southeast, you have parents that are knowledgeable, knowingly selling their children. For sex, uh, for um, for luxury items, even you know, oh. in Cambodia, um, the customers are prominently Westerners that go there and buy little girls that are at six, seven years old for sex. Oh, yeah. well, we thank you for what you're doing. We're going to be praying for you, thank you. and we are going to um, make sure that we share this because you've heard it now, mm -hmm. viewer, in the new international version of the Bible, Isaiah 61, one says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. Mm -hmm. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, right. to proclaim liberty to the captives yes. and freedom to prisoners. Brian and Sophie are being used by God to help set the captives free. Mm -hmm. Won't you help them in this endeavor? Ask the Holy Spirit just how much you should give in support of this mission. Freely you have received, freely give. Well. We've reached the end of another program, you guys. Thank you so much for thank being with you. us. It was wonderful. So what a blessing. <laughs> God's got a great thing in store for you. And thank you, Jay. <laughs> Join us next time because it just wouldn't be the same without you. <laughs>